this has been amazingly cathartic to us because we have been the poster child of a scandal for the last 18 months and we have never been allowed to be proud of what we've done. We've never been able to be publicly proud of our students, our, our, our recent grads. So I'll try to start from there from my prepared notes and get off this, uh, this little emotional um, start. Um, as ever mentioned this morning, in her opening remarks, in December 14th of last year, we, we faced uh, an enormous, um, an enormous uh, 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 leak to the press of some offensive and sexist homophobic Facebook posts that arose from our uh, private Facebook group comprised of most of the male students, uh, male members of our Dalhousie Doctor of Dental Surgery class. Um, The story was broadcast widely and repeatedly by regional, national, international news agencies, and the posts targeted and directly harmed specific women in the class and indirectly women in general. What Deborah didn't mention this morning, that within days, a petition with over 10,000 signatures called upon, oh, not 10,000, tens of thousands of signatures called upon the university president to expel the offending students. Within days of the media release of the post, a number of Canadian professional dental regulatory bodies were calling for the names of the men and wanting to make sure that if the disciplined students applied for licenses, they would be facing difficulty. I don't think there could be a clearer Um, a clear indication of the devastating impact on the public trust that the Facebook posts created by these young men, senior health professional students, students who are seen by the public to be in a great position of privilege and responsibility could have had. So for this panel, I was actually asked by Jennifer to focus on the relationship of public trust as core to professionalism. So it is safe to say that the Facebook issue represents a very particular example connecting professionalism, in this case, by extension through our professional students, with public trust. I was asked to share my experiences in 2015 in my role as chair of the fourth year Doctor of Dental Surgery, ASCC, which is the Academic Standards Class Committee at at our faculty in Dalhousie. And the ASCC is a standing committee responsible for monitoring progress and performance of fourth year dental students, determining their clinical uh, and professional competency and ultimately their fitness to graduate. So I have a very particular vantage point to address the second part of what I was asked to consider, which is the potential of a restorative approach approach to foster and sustain public trust. Um, In in the session tomorrow on professionalism in workplaces, we are going to have an opportunity to discuss specific goals, processes, challenges, and operational details of the restorative process undertaken for the Facebook issue. So here I just want to hit a few highlights about the Dalhousie experience, how we came to be engaged with RJ, a bit about our outcomes in relation to both restorative justice theory, and finally back to the issue of public trust. Managing our response to the the Facebook scandal, as both Deb and and Amanda um, mentioned this morning, was very complicated by the multitude of voices with strong opinions on the right thing to do. Some, many of which were very critical of RJ and, and, and uh, did not approve of the RJ process. Many felt the issues around the Facebook incident um, were black and white. A group of students did a terrible thing. They should be expelled. Thankfully, in response to their sexual harassment complaint, a number of the young woman, women who were harmed by the Facebook posts chose restorative justice as the most promising path toward meaningful change. In choosing, and with the participation of the majority of their classmates, including 12 of the 13 Facebook group members who engaged with that restorative process, these same women set the tone by recognizing that punitive measures such as expulsion would not change attitudes or positively influence future behavior, nor would they address the underlying systemic problems which they believe contributed to the issues. In establishing a process for managing an issue of such magnitude, with a quarter of the graduating class conditionally suspended from their clinic privileges, um, the committee actually 
quickly began to appreciate the benefits of engaging with a restorative approach. And Karen Crombie um, eloquently explained how we were able to embed the restorative justice process into our, into our processes that, that already existed. We didn't fully understand the RJ process when we started, but we were in. And we were deeply invested in our students. So, so this was a, a, a prime motivation for us. First, uh, the, event, the event was unprecedented, of course, in our experience, and probably in anybody's experience for that matter. But there were a number of things that were directly and immediately appealing. First, addressing the harms to the women remained the first priority. Second was the educational appeal, relationally situated amongst classmates, facilitators, faculty, and experts. Dentistry is a self-regulating profession, so the opportunity for peers to be so directly and actively involved was extremely valuable and something the women also identified as important to them. And at the same time, and as tough as it has been, the space to reflect on educational implications of our own climate and culture to the Facebook incident is critical to moving forward in a positive way. Third was more practical, again, but again unprecedented, and this, this is, as I mentioned, was the ability that the ASC was able to establish and address our formal ethics and professionalism remediation responsibilities in alliance with the RJ process. In other words, we were not working at cross-purposes, and in fact, to a large extent, the ASC's specific values and, um, and desires for outcomes were integrated and achieved within the restorative process. And fourth, we had access to international leaders, as we've heard about already today, in restorative justice within and beyond our campus and exceptionally skilled and deeply committed facilitators on the ground to support us. I want to turn for a moment to what I'm calling practice to theory. Um, this is, I guess, the academic coming out of me a little bit. Because I suggested that what we entered into as a faculty had applied educational and student development appeal uh, we, when we entered into it without really fully appre appreciating where it could take us. And knowing that our process was the beneficiary of international expertise from the outset, I'm now aware of how this theoretical grounding likely informed our process in the first place. And here, at the risk of oversimplifying, I draw on some of the recent work of David Karp and Casey Sachs, where they explore student accountability and describe indicators of college student development within student conduct processes. It has been extremely valuable to reflect on whether and how our process aligned with these indicators and aspirations for our, for our process. My, my personal responses arise from the multiple interactions we had with the suspended students in restorative circles, in one-on-one -on -one meetings with them, in their reflective writing, in their actions and contributions to understanding culture and climate and ultimately their interactions and relationships with their classmates, faculty, staff, patients, and the public at large. So for the first two, community, uh, just community and self-authorship, did our students have the opportunity to internalize moral norms and, rec and recognize the wrongfulness of the misconduct? And with respect to active accountability, did they understand the consequences of the behavior on others? Did this include repairing the harm in a way that fosters trust? Yes to all of these questions. And this was exemplified by their actions and by their enduring commitment to, the restorative, to restorative justice. No matter who they faced and how tough it became, we observed firsthand the power of their personal expressions of truth and remorse and the ownership and responsibility they took for their actions. Interpersonal competence in this regard, our students excelled beyond expectations. Consider for a moment that these men returned to clinic practice following months of self-reflection, public humiliation and criticism, and under a great deal of scrutiny. While they had already been regaining the trust of those harmed, circle by circle, now they were earning public trust, patient by patient, and encounter by encounter. This was very hard work. Social ties to institution. The institution in our case extended beyond the university environment. Our students had the broader institution of their profession to consider, and their ties extended beyond social to formal. In this regard, the key and consistent message that students reflected was the recognition that, as a professional, their personal identity is, no, is not separate from their professional identity, and they will always have to live to the higher standards expected of them in both their professional and private lives. 
Procedural fairness, we established processes that enabled goals of addressing harms and professional remediation to align. And although there was a steep learning curve, I like to think that the ASCC reflected the example set by the restorative justice facilitators in working relationally with the men and with equal care, concern, honour, fairness and dignity. Closure, were the students able to learn from their mistakes and move on? Yes, they had. Closure was very formal in the form of personal meetings and written determinations, ultimately recommending our students for graduation and licensure. So returning to my original question as to whether a restorative approach has the potential to foster public trust, the proof is in the pudding. You may meet some of our 2015 graduates over the next two days, so you will see for yourself the fine professionals they are. More formally, though, we actually had a direct measure of public trust arising from this process. Our graduating students were all licensed, regionally, nationally, and internationally, into a self-regulating profession without limitations to their licenses. The jury is still out for the long-term changes to culture and climate, These things take time. They will depend upon the extent to which our faculty as a whole and our students continue to do the hard work of deserving and maintaining our future stewardship of public trust. Thank you.